We are now just starting to see the effects of the recent airstrikes in Syria. Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joins me from Los Angeles. Lisa, U.S. President Trump said not one of the 100 missiles was shot down. He was pretty excited about that, pretty pumped. Yeah, everyone is uh, declaring victory on this one. So we have uh, the White House and the Pentagon giving us briefings about the success of these very targeted strikes that were, in their opinion, quite successful at hitting these chemical uh, depots. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we're hearing reports that Assad is very happy and he's touting the uh, capabilities of himself and the Russians and their uh, ability to bounce back from this. Uh, there are speculations that this didn't work, and then there are claims that it did work. In the meantime, uh, the experts that have been sent to uh, evaluate uh, have not been able to get access to these areas, and uh, whether or not they worked, we'll have to believe that, that they did, and that this was, uh, whether symbolic or effective, a, a step in the right direction with regards to how the U.S. and the West was able to react to Assad using chemical weapons on civilians. So recently, after the U.S. airstrikes in Syria, Lisa, Assad launches a new onslaught against the rebels. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, this is, again, business as usual. In, in Syria, you have so many layers to this civil war, and each group out to uh, basically take their agenda further. And for the Assad regime, it's not the Western allies in the United States that he's worried about. It's more the rebels that are on the ground in Syria trying to topple the Assad regime. So whenever there is a moment of uh, instability or chaos, Assad's going to go after his main enemies, which are, are the rebels. They're the ones that they're his Achilles heel. They're the ones who keep him up at night. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's no surprise that in this, in this moment, uh, we're going to see much more bloodshed when it comes to these pockets of insurgencies within Syria. So, Lisa, Assad is touting that he used Russian weapons after the U.S. strike in Syria. A former chemical weapons chief says Assad can still use it on his own people despite the airstrikes? <laughs> You know, the airstrikes happened. The hearsay is that they, the chemical weapons were, A, moved by the Russians, or B, the other uh, speculation here is that they have uh, chemical weapons in different places. I mean, look, this has been going on for many, many years. Remember the red line that President Obama drew in the sand about Assad using chemical weapons? So that's the first time we heard a warning from the West uh, with regards to Assad's use of chemical weapons. We knew that he used them many times before that warning and many times after that warning. But what did this warning allow Assad to do is to have a running start with regards to hiding uh, his chemical weapons program. And it's not just Assad. We have to remember the trifecta here. Assad getting help by the Iranians, by the Russians, uh, to hide their uh, capabilities. I think, you know, this is something that uh, Assad, whether, he, he, whether it's his own doing or his helper's doings, has become masterful at really waiting until everyone looks away to carry out more attacks on civilians. Now, U.S. President Trump has gone on record saying he wants the U.S. forces out of Syria ASAP. But at the same time, the Trump administration is also warning of another attack on Syria if chemical weapons are used once again. Yeah. So if you remember, this was uh, President Trump just a couple weeks ago saying, we're out. And then, you know, on the eve of that statement, having this chemical weapons attack, reminding uh, President Trump that his advisors may be right and it might, might not be time just yet to surrender uh, in Syria and hand over the situation to the Iranian regime, to the Russians and to uh, the, the Assad regime. Uh, so I think, you know, this is a reminder that, you know, the United States and the allies have to have you know, an awareness about what's going on in Syria, not necessarily to park our, tr our troops there for years to come. I think there are lessons to be learned about Afghanistan and about Iraq, but there are also lessons to be learned about those two uh, examples in that uh, the United States and the Western allies were able to make uh, significant changes in uh, driving the outcome there. And with regards to Syria, uh, we're fighting a much more sensitive uh, and multi-layered fight there. So if the U.S. were to uh, surrender, and I use that word surrender because we're basically handing over the situation to uh, enemies uh, that, that could affect 
U.S. assets in the region and affect our national security back at home. So we're not just fighting the Assad regime. We don't even have really a clear say in whether or not we care if Assad should stay or go. And I think that that was the initial um, challenge in the U.S. getting involved and making a strong, you know, taking a strong stance in the Syrian civil war. What do we want? What's the what's the best outcome for the West uh, with what happens in Syria? But when you have the Russians involved, you have the Iranian regime involved, you have a pass-off scenario involved, we're looking at many, many more layers to this. Now, does the U.S. is going to hit Russia with new sanctions after the Syria strike. Does Vladimir Putin really care, though, Lisa? <laughs> you know, Vladimir Putin uh, has a very interesting way of showing when he does care and when he doesn't care. And for the most part, he shows us that he can still flex his muscles and he doesn't care. He has weapons parked in Syria all over. He's still busy in the Ukraine. Uh, you know, he's, they, they still have their cyber uh, bullying capabilities quite strong and, and, and showing us uh, that they have those capabilities all around the world. So I think when it comes to uh, the, the, the Russian um, kind of... Uh, presence globally, it's important to keep the pressure on. And I think uh, Nikki Haley at the UN nailed it, you know, in her uh, interviews yesterday, uh, over the weekend, uh, when she basically said that we will apply the pressure. We will put sanctions where we need to, and we will put the pressure on Russia, because we've just let that go for way too long. And it's been a free-for-all in the Middle East for Vladimir Putin. So Putin is predicting global chaos if the West strikes Syria again. What do you think that'll look like? Yeah, he doesn't like people getting involved in his in his Syria. He doesn't like any of this um, Western intervention. Uh, you know, Vladimir Putin got involved in Syria about four or five years ago when he assured uh, President Obama that he would take care of the chemical weapons, and we know how that went. Uh, so now I think it's his territory. We've allowed that uh, in the West. And, uh, you know, I think that that's where the Russians have played out the clock, the Iranians uh, as well, and have taken control of the chaos in Syria, allowing them to have a foothold in the Middle East, in the middle of all this chaos. And now it's, you know, it's we're, we're walking in on this, you know, years later and trying to sort out the same issue we had before. We got involved, we drew the red line, because of chemical weapons use in Syria. And here we are in 2018 talking about the same thing. So Arab leaders are calling for a probe into the Syrian chemical attacks and condemning Iran. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I think that the Arab countries are finally waking up to the real uh, war in the Middle East, and that is a Shiite-Sunni war. And the Iranians have taken this to the next level. Their involvement in Syria has nothing to do with uh, Bashar al-Assad, has nothing to do with the U.S., but has everything to do with carrying forward the Shiite uh, desire to dominate the region. Uh, and because of that, that's why we saw the Israeli airstrikes in uh, Syria, because Israel is worried about the pass-off scenario. Those were Iranian assets that Israel had to go after. And why? Because of Hezbollah, because they could use that. They could pass it along to Lebanon, who can strike uh, Israel, Syria can strike Israel. I mean, you have to look at Israel's positioning here with all these Arab nations around it that are able to strike uh, Israel overnight. And because of that, I think the Arab nations who don't necessarily have, you know, a, a, a friendly or warm relationship with Israel, but they're in the same position as Israel, finally. You have a time in history where the Arab nations are facing the same threat that Israel has faced for 70 years, and that's the threat of terrorism within their borders. And because of that threat, you have Arab nations waking up to this and calling out Iran. Iran's global terror agenda. And I think, you know, one, once you have Arab nations on board with Israel and these alliances forming that are so unusual, you know that, that there is a time where we can make a significant difference uh, in the Middle East and hopefully rid or at least diminish the threat of this Islamic Republic of Iran that, that exports terrorism so freely. So Hamas sees Gaza protests as peaceful and as a deadly weapon. Can you explain? Yes, we've had protests in Gaza for a couple of weeks now, and this is all leading up to the May 15th official transfer of the U.S.-Israeli embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Again, this is as clear as saying the sky is blue. This is the capital of Israel. 
the embassy should have been in, in, in Jerusalem from day one. It wasn't. It would be as, as if the White House was in the United States was suddenly moved from Washington to Miami and people thought it was weird to move it back to Washington. Uh, this is Israel's capital. That's where their court uh, is. That's where all the federal buildings are. And, uh, of course, where there can be an uproar, uh, there is an uproar. And terror organization Hamas, who controls the Palestinian people, they have the loudest and largest, um, uh, most influential voice over the Palestinian people, are controlling these protests. And the media, unfortunately, a large segment of the media, uh, reports this as peaceful protests in Gaza over the announcement of the embassy. But we know very well that this is Hamas, uh, hijacking the Palestinian people's minds, hearts, their energy, putting them out on the streets to protest. These are not peaceful protests, and they will very definitely continue through May 15. Now, as you and I are well aware, drugs are a major problem in countries around the world. The opioid crisis rearing its ugly head in the United States and Canada. But the U.S. is actually helping Mexico with a new high-tech way of fighting opium, Lisa. Yes. You know, this is I, I love stories like this because... Uh, you know, you look at the collaboration between nations when you look at a lot of the media reports talking only about the escalation or the heating of tensions between Mexico and the United States because of Donald Trump's uh, quote unquote uh, insensitive comments, because of the wall, because Donald Trump said the Mexicans have to pay for the wall, because Donald Trump said he wants to put troops at the wall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then you have stories like this one that show that these. Uh, newer threats, this um, dual-use uh, businesses where uh, terrorists and other foul players use businesses such as drugs and the drug cartels coming into the United States or going across the border um, are able to use uh, lucrative businesses such as uh, cocaine and, and opium uh, trade in, in order to hide their other activities. And because of this, we, have, we finally have a, a United States government that has woken up to this threat and is able to actually collaborate in a meaningful way. Uh, it's funny because we, we thought that we're in such a bad time where, where a relationship between Mexico and the U.S. is so strained and so awful. But then you hear about stories like this where collaboration is higher than it's ever been before in certain ways. And uh, really, there is a sharing of intel with many countries, is a sharing of, of ideas with regards to to new ways of fighting terror, new ways of fighting cyber terror, et cetera. And uh, this, again, a wonderful story to show that collaboration. It certainly is. Our foreign affairs and ISIS expert, Lisa Daftari, joining me via Skype from Los Angeles. Thanks again, Lisa. Of course.